Hi everyone, the TD Ottawa Jazz Festival would like nothing more than to welcome you to our main stage at Confederation Park, downtown Ottawa. That's our home. But as we all know, that's not going to happen. So we've got the next best thing and are bringing the music to you through a series called Tenacity, which will unfold every day for the next 10 days and will feature some of the brightest and most unique artists from all over the world. You'll get to meet and hear artists from Berlin, New York, Boston, Vancouver, Ottawa, Serbia, and other places. This series is different. This series is jazz today. It's vibrant, courageous, tenacious, and masterfully original. Thanks for joining us. This is Jazz in 2020. Good evening and welcome to OLG Chats. I'm James Hale from Downbeat Magazine. And each day of Tenacity, we'll be talking to some of the incredible impro improvising artists who'll be sharing their music with us. And it's a beautiful evening here in Ottawa. It's an evening where we'd love to be outside in Confederation Park under the stars. You know, we love to be surrounded by fellow music fans. We'd love to hug friends we haven't seen. We'd love to be free, unfettered by masks and distance. We'd love to, but we can't. Uh, but creativity can't be shut down and locked up. Our music can't be silenced. We we'll always have the music. And this evening, we have some amazing music, courtesy of three of the world's best improvising artists. This evening, we welcome Chris Davis on piano, Lena Alamano on trumpet, and Anna Weber on saxophone. And the music they're gonna share with us was improvised in isolation. Chris improvised her keyboard part, passed it on to Lena with the instruction not to listen before she added her part, and then Lena passed it on to Anna with the same instructions. We're going to hear it tonight for the first time together, but first, let's delve a little deeper into the process, and we'll welcome Chris, Lena, and Anna. Hi, how you doing? Howdy. <laughs> uh, Chris, I don't, want to, I don't want to dwell too much in these conversations about, you know, what we've all gone through during this pandemic, you know, I'm kind of tired of talking about that, but I did want to ask you specifically because you had an epic year in 2019. Uh, your, your last uh, recording was really enthusiastically received, not just in the music media, but also in mainstream media, like the New York Times, you won polls. And I think you did something kind of on the level of what Esperanza Spalding and Dave Douglas have done in the past, you know, which is it's pretty rare to kind of break through in one year when, you know, you've been on the scene for a while. So I wonder what it was like for you suddenly to not have an audience, have a lot of ears on you because you were getting so much publicity and not be able to get out there and share your art with people the way you normally do. Yeah, it's strange. <laughs> I don't know any other word for it. Um, you know, it's, uh, I was so blessed to have so many people, you know, interested and who love the record and, um, and yeah, just a lot of sort of attention and those sorts of things really the, for me, they're just an opportunity to, you know, play more, have new opportunities to reach new audiences. And suddenly that was, you know, stopped short by the pandemic. So, um, you know, I'm home now and we're all dealing with this new reality and, uh, yeah, it's just a it's just a strange time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Lena, I think you were you were still in Berlin, right? When uh, where you teach when the pandemic hit? I don't teach, but I was in Berlin. Yeah, uh, I was there for a, a week. Yeah, and then I had to come back mm -hmm. unexpectedly. Yeah, it was it was it was very strange for sure. <laughs> a bit Anna, traumatic, actually. Anna, what's your uh, what's your pandemic experience been like? Uh, well, I was in Europe on tour when things were starting to get really bad over there. And I was, um, because I, I don't have permanent residency in the U.S., I just have a visa. I was worried that they would cut off travel and that they wouldn't allow anybody who didn't have permanent residency back into the country. And uh, 
I thought that was a far-fetched, like, paranoid thing to be thinking. But then I got back, and then a week later, they actually did that. They cut off access back to the U.S. for anybody who didn't have permanent residency or citizenship. So I felt pretty uh, pretty grateful that I got to get home. Um, yeah, and, you know, same as everybody else. Like, all my work canceled. Just trying to figure out what to do now. And yeah. how to uh, continue to make music. Yeah, I was always thinking, like, you know, jazz musicians are some of the most creative people I know. And, you know, you find ways of getting around this. I was talking to the pianist Christian Sands a few weeks ago at, for an article. And, and uh, you know, we obviously we get talking about how things are going. And he had his piano sitting behind him when we we're on Zoom call. And he said he thought that what was going to happen was that musicians are going to come out of this different because he said, you know, when you're on the road, you don't have time to practice, you know, especially if you're a pianist. You know, you're lucky if you have a, have a piano, you know, for, for a few minutes in a sound check or something, but you don't have a piano to practice with. And he said, in his experience anyway, he said, I think a lot of musicians are going to have a lot of time to practice and woodshed and more than they've had in a long time. And they're going to they're going to explore new things and they're going to come out of it a bit different. What are your what are your thoughts on that, Chris? I mean, I, I agree that we're going to come out of this uh, different, but um you know, from everyone I've talked to, everyone's reacted to this differently. So some people have been invigorated to practice and write. Some people have just, you know, felt totally uninspired and have focused their creativity, um, you know, in other places. So um, I've, I've definitely been one of the people that, you know, have not felt super creative um, in this moment. And in a way, um, well, I guess I'm taking this time to just rest and you know part of part of being an artist is also just to you know there's times of productivity but there's times to also just you know sit back and let the next thing come in and and rest your mind so that the creativity can flow again and i'm using this time um really to to create that space mm -hmm. well speaking of creating let's let's delve a little bit deeper into the into the music we're going to hear tonight so Chris, you wanted to create a piece of music that left space for Lena and Anna, but I'm wondering what else was on your mind in terms of, of where to go with what you were going to create. Um, I think a lot of listeners are, are really fascinated by that kind of improvisation, whether it be, you know, Keith Jarrett's solo concerts that he used to do where he, you know, like set out to be like tabula rasa when he walked on stage, not had anything in his mind at all, um, or anyone else who creates something out of out of air seemingly. So what what's your process like when when you sat down to do this? What you know was there a motif you had in mind, or where did you want to take it? Yeah, not really. Um, it started really with the creativity, maybe through teaching. Um, this was an, an assignment I gave my students. Um, right after, you know, we were quarantined after the pandemic. And um, I asked them to improvise to some of the Beria sequenzas, um, which are virtuosic pieces for a variety of instruments. Um, so they were all assigned a piece. And, you know, I said, don't listen to this ahead of time, improvise with it, record yourself playing with it, and we'll listen to it in the class. Um, and it kind of came from, I don't know if you know Ben Gerstein, the great trombone player um, and improviser, uh, but he's also, he's always so creative trying to come up with ways of interacting with uh, preformed or pre, I mean, recordings um, where he'll slow things down, he'll, you know, make videos. He's just like a super creative person. And that was sort of inspiring to me to pass that on to my students and see what they could come up with. Um, so after they came back and played these pieces and some of them turned out really, really great. I thought, okay, well now it's, it's my turn. I have to see <laughs> if I can make this work. Uh, so I recorded the initial piece and um, I, the only thing I had in mind was just, I wanted to leave space because, and I tried to imagine, you know, what Lena and Anna might do um, around what I was playing. And that's all, that was all that was really in my mind uh, recording this first track. Mm. Now, Lena, you just, you just released your own brilliant solo album. And uh, yet you said in an earlier interview today that this kind of scared you, this process. And it kind of made me think of something Kenny Wheeler told me once about his his own experiences playing free improvisation. He said that, you know, he it, it really scared him, but he loved 
the process. And I'm, I'm wondering, what is it that keeps, keeps you pushing yourself into uncomfortable territory? I mean, most people hate to push themselves out of their comfort zone. <laughs> what, right. What, what wow. That's, that's a loaded one, James. Uh, <laughs> are you my therapist? Um, uh, yeah, no, it's, um, I, I, yeah, I, I guess I just, uh, I'm, I'm always looking for, for, uh, I guess I hadn't thought of it as being uncomfortable situations, but I, but when you're in a situation where you, you're forced to um, come up with something new, then uh, yeah, it just opens up, you know, everything. So I, I think, uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not the type to, to, to want to, you know, get too comfortable, I guess, in some ways. So I, uh, I don't, I don't know why. Yeah. I like taking risks and uh, finding, finding new stuff. I mean, the reason I thought that this particular project was slightly terrifying because <laughs> I knew there would be this disconnection of what we're used to when we improvise, where, you know, it's interactive. So I knew that this would be very uh, jarring to experience the, you know, improvising with a great improviser who seemingly not listening to you, <laughs> but, but feeding, but also, you know, just giving instead of, uh, you know, having the, the exchange. So I think that's what I was afraid of, uh, of how that would feel and how I would deal with that. And then also knowing that there would be another element added. Um, so that, but yeah, in the end, I really enjoyed, I really enjoyed the, um, those 15 minutes of, you know, playing with Chris's recorded track. It was really, it was really fun. But I, but yeah, terrifying because I don't know, you know, <laughs> it's like a whole new territory. Yeah. You, you don't usually play music with people who can't hear you, so. <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't cheat at all you didn't you didn't like, go, you know three minutes into it and then oh i'll back up and no no i didn't cheat because i knew i couldn't only do that i could only have this experience the one time so mm -hmm. i thought i better just just go for it yeah. yeah so anna you had the most material to work with but the least amount of space how did you approach your contribution i mean i just tried to imagine that we were all in a room together making music and I think because I had the you know fully formed well I had both Lena and Chris behind me um I had probably an easier time than everybody else because I didn't have to think about like okay well somebody else is going to come in here and I have to make sure that I you know leave enough space for anybody so yeah I mean to me you know it was I was just improvising as if um we were all playing together and there were some moments where you know like I landed on something and then all of a sudden somebody else actually echoed that afterwards. And I think that speaks to a common knowledge of just like form and, and language between improvisers generally, but it also felt pretty like special and miraculous when those things happened. And when I knew that there actually wasn't, you know, nobody was actually hearing me. <laughs> <laughs> now you guys did a hilarious uh, interview earlier with Alan Neal for those outside Ottawa. He's a host of CBC radio here. And uh, it, it was suggested that uh, we leave the bikes on so you can provide uh, commentary, sort of like one of those extra reels, you know, in Se Seinfeld or something, you know, when they put out the DVD. Um, well, we can't do that, but I'm, I'm wondering in, in general, um, do any of you listen to improvisations you've done and then, and then incorporate what, you know, what you've done into future things? You know, Duke Ellington famously would, you know, would, would listen to recordings of of his his orchestra playing and and take you know pieces of you know johnny hodges that he really loved and and you know and build a composition around that do you ever listen back to your improvisations and and build on them or do you just leave it behind and, and move on to the next thing anybody can answer that um I, I guess i could jump in i just i i did do that a little bit actually with the solo recording that you were referencing um because i i had a few days to record and so and i didn't really have I had some things planned, but some things weren't. And so I, I did do that. I, I recorded some improvisations and then I listened to them. And then the next day I had kind of jotted out and made compositions out of them. So, because I wanted it to be a bit more focused. Um, so some of those pieces are started out as improvisations, I guess. Mm -hmm. So yes, I did do that. <laughs> Chris, what about you? Do you go back um, or move yeah. on? Well, I wrote a piece uh, for my trio with Tom Rainey and John Aber um, a while back, where I had recorded an improvisation um, that we had done, and then 
went back and transcribed the whole thing and wrote it out like this one section as an actual tune. So then we played that piece as a tune um, later on and that can be heard. That's on the record, Good Citizen. So I don't remember what the name of that track was <laughs> on the record. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, I just, the thing that I'm missing so much in this pandemic and not playing, it's like when you're playing with people, you're also in conversation with yourself night after night and you know you're constantly like oh i should have i wish i could have done that or i didn't quite get to that on the piano let me go home and practice it so that maybe if it comes up the next time i'll be able to grab it you know and um i just i miss this conversation you know this internal conversation um i'm sure we all do um mm. so you know, I, I do think it is it is part of the process. And, and I'm constantly, if I try something when I'm improvising, that can become part of a tune later on and vice versa. So it, it is just between composing, improvising, um, you know, and listening. It's just this constant conversation. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking of listening, um, let's get to the adventure, the experiment, as you call <laughs> it. And uh, it's going to be an experiment and an adventure for all of us. So uh, so let's get to it and enjoy. Okay. Music brings us together even when we're apart. That's why we're so proud to support Canadian music through events like the TD Ottawa Jazz Festival. It's just one more way that the TD Ready commitment is building a more inclusive tomorrow. Enjoy the show.
Tonight, we've been listening to Chris Davis on piano, Lena Alamano on trumpet, Anna Weber on saxophone. And we hope you've enjoyed this first concert in tenacity, and we really hope you'll be able to join us for more. Tomorrow at 5 p.m. Eastern, we're going to be treated to a very special interactive performance by Tin Man in the Telephone. And then at 7 p.m., we invite you to share the music of Bad, Bad, Not Good. That's all for this evening. I'm James Hale. Stay cool and keep supporting the music. <laughs>